Greetings gang, welcome to Windrush Wargamers, I'm Joe and I'm Nick and today we're going to be talking through our proxy video for the Angmar faction for Middle Earth strategy battle game. By Angmar you mean Arnold? Yes. So Nick this was primarily your doing wasn't it? Yeah. So this was a big thing for your kind of personal development uh, within the hobby wasn't it Nick because you don't really do a lot of the hobby side of it. You you had a crack at Isengard about six years ago. Six years ago, yeah. Did my and you haven't yeah. you haven't really picked up a paintbrush since. No. So a lot of the, you haven't been kind of drilling like techniques or anything. So this was a kind of uh, big step up. So it's a big moment for you, isn't it? Yeah, I had to relearn some of the techniques that I had forgotten in the eons <laughs> when I last completed an army. But yeah. yeah, this was very fulfilling. It's good for for a set. What is essentially a first crack at an army? Is pretty good to be fair. So if we start right at the beginning, so um, you took your own advice technically in your with our proxy video. Yeah. Uh, you used the obviously the Fireforge games, Northman Bowman and Northman Warriors. Uh, those kits, from my perspective, look really amazing. A lot of non-GW kits give a lot of extras. Yeah. And um, you were able to utilize a lot of different head poses and the capes and whatnot yeah. and the weapon options. Yeah, they're able to squeeze out a couple more miniatures as well. Um, because it advertises like 10 in each, right? We were able to make like 13. Yeah. So as you can see from the footage here, with very minimal conversion work, these are still yet to be tidied up. Um, there's a lot of different poses you can get from the same kit. Another thing I really like is the kind of torches. They're really atmospheric because it, you know, it really seems like they're in the dark and the cold and there's uh, Angmar kind of approaching from every corner to, yeah. to assault them. Uh, they look really cool to be fair. Same thing goes for the bowmen, if not even more so. So you've got both unhelmeted and helmeted heads and you've got loads of different poses with the bows, right? So you've got some arrows stuck in the ground. Yeah, some of them have quivers, some of them have arrows stuck in the ground, some of them uh, don't have either. So they're, like, uh, they're getting desperate, they're getting overwhelmed. That's, yeah, they, that's, that's they, basically Arnor in a nutshell if you read the lore. Okay, so why don't you tell everyone about the sort of captains, because all four of the captains, both uh, a captain with bow, captain with sword and board, and King Arthur Dewey, and uh, Malbeth the Seer, yeah. they're all converted in proxies, aren't they? So why don't you talk to everyone about them? Well, the captains are Gondorian, um, the trebuchet loaders, you know, the ones with the ones that are unarmed and like they're posing with their arms, sort of akimbo. Uh, they're really tall, so they kind of fit in with the the almost epic scale of the Northmen. Uh, and the idea is because they got that extra defense, uh, that could be just plate armor. So from the captains up to the head honcho, how was the King Arvadui conversion completed? Uh, I don't know, you did it. All oh, right, yeah. So <laughs> basically, this is something we kind of thought he. If you look at the miniature, the official miniature, which I don't think they even sell on the store anymore. He, he has a you know a fur lined coat over some some armor, uh, some chainmail on as well, and also he looks kind of like, in my opinion, King Theoden anyway. Yeah. Um, and so the idea was basically to just do a simple head swap with because he's only armed with a sword and just use the Denethor body with a the plastic King Theoden head, and then just blend between uh, the the two textures. Um, with some green stuff for, and that was as simple as it gets really. Yeah. So from the king now to his seer, so how was the Malbeth conversion completed? Oh, I used the old Radagast, you know, the, the pre-Hobbit uh, Radagast, the more dignified looking one. And yeah, it's it good was to, the one without bird shit on his head. Yeah. <laughs> it's good to put that model to use because that is a very nice looking sculpt. It looks sort of so almost old school fantasy if you sort of take a look at it. Yeah. And so what was done to convert him? Uh, initially, he has the raven on his the right hand. Right? I cut that off, replace that with a pointing finger from, once again, the Northman's proof. Yeah. So you're uh, saying, look, I've seen something. Yeah. The Over sea. there. Yeah. Ah. Other than that, we put uh, some fur trim on his, uh, underneath his hood to, mo to basically fit with Arthur Dewey a bit more. So the paint scheme of the off red, the kind of salmon-y pink almost, and the green, where did that come from, Nick? That is from Medieval 2 Total War. It's the Hungarian paint scheme, which I always wanted to use because it sort of looks... Uh, it's not what one would associate with hardened warriors, but it does look a bit sort of cool in my opinion. Yeah, I like it too, and it's 
it, you know, red and green opposites on the color wheel, so they pop nicely against each other. And I mean, often in the game, you get m more of the color as the as the uh, as you go up with the with the kind of professional knight. But as yeah. you, the rank of file troops, a lot of them will have a lot of duller colors. So to contrast against that, you use a lot of um, kind of brown tones and, and beige tones and whatnot. Yeah. They're all wearing uh, gloves. If you look at the miniatures, uh, so well, mine up. Yeah. Like well, mine up. But yeah. it's just an excuse to add a bit more. Uh, not only is because it, it's his collar and Arnold, but it's an excuse to add a bit more of that sort of earth tone. Yeah. Let me know in the comments about what you think about this scheme, by the way, because I assumed it would be an acquired taste. You know, a lot's made about bright color schemes, uh, and they're you know, Middle Earth ranges. A little bit more subdued, which I like. I yeah. definitely like. Every now and again, though, it's quite cool to jump into very bright colours. So uh, you can see throughout history, having duller camouflage colours actually a fairly recent phenomenon. Yeah. You know, very bright, vibrant colours in normal dress as well as warfare has been was the rule of, of thumb for various different reasons. Being able to see each other, being able to identify coats of arms, etc. Also. In the age of gunpowder, having the bright red or the bright blue, yeah, could mean you could see people and hear people through the through the, the crowd of drummer boys and whatnot. So um, it's quite interesting to see you know jumping into that color because they're not inspired by the Peter Jackson film necessarily. It's kind of the point of heraldry is to sort of represent, and th these are my recognizable colors. Look at the deeds I've done in war. Yeah, and so if you look at the G Dub miniatures for Arnold. Uh, they're, they're, they're sort of like a variation on, on a theme mm. with the Gondorian ones, but they have look a bit more sort of. They got the banded, the helmet band, yeah, and they're in a, a sort of green. Which they're is, like Renaissance Italians, almost. Yeah, it's a bit more audacious looking, which is kind of one of the uh, inspirations I did for picking this uh, Magyar scheme from Medieval Two, is because that looks audacious as well. Yeah. I mean, notice that um, both on the shields and on the banner, there's a lack of insignia. That's because uh, me starting out, it was a bit intimidating to try and do some stuff freehand. Plus, uh, I didn't know what to use, you know? Uh, in the actual uh, official models, they use this sort of ringed pillar almost, which I think it looks is... like a vagina in with chains around it. <laughs> yeah, that's meant to be the well, palantir, well, I guess, well, where the, yeah. uh, the seeing stones come from. It's from Arnold. So, let's look kind of at the overall process. Did you enjoy it? That's the main thing. Yes, I did. Very much. It was fun putting them together, fun uh, seeing what poses I can put these guys in. Uh, every aspect of it was uh, enjoyable. Oh, great. So, you, you might keep painting and stuff going forward? Definitely. I think I need to because uh, if you take a look at uh, the models that Joe painted compared to the models I painted, there's a massive discrepancy <laughs> painting ability because uh, I think it's just practice. Yeah, I think uh, overall it's it's you know it's, they're in a good place. They're they're ones that you could easily pick up again and go back to because you know there's relatively few layers of paint. Yeah. So you're not going to be missing detail. So once you build up skills, you can pick them up again and uh, put some put some more layers on there. Yeah. So I think for for a first army, really well done. That pretty much covers it. Uh, let me know uh, in the comments if I can do anything differently, uh, how I can improve. Uh, as I, as we said a few times, I'm just coming back into this hobby after a long sort of absence so I'm not going to be uh, hitting the target as he did as... do too much before as well nah <laughs> but I'm not going to be uh, hitting bullseyes for a while now I'm going to be sort of building out my abilities so any constructive criticism would be uh, would be greatly appreciated uh, also uh, if you have any thoughts on the insignia I should use when you get back to these guys uh, pop them in the comments and hope you guys have a good day yeah, thanks very much for watching. I've been Joe from Windish Wargamers. This has been Nick from Windish Wargamers. Signing out.